people want to connect with people, you know, and make the story interesting. Business of Architecture, episode 420. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable architecture practice that doesn't get in the way of the architecture. In today's episode, you'll discover more about social media for architects. Now, this is an interview. It's a rebroadcast of an interview with an architect named Brian Tover. Brian runs the podcast, New Architecture Books, and he reached out to me to ask me about the book, Social Media for Architects. In this book, you'll discover the answer to some questions like, is social media still relevant for architects today? Is it possible to get clients from social media? And what, if any, exposure or activity should you be doing right now as a firm principal in your architecture firm regarding social media? Or should you just hire an agency and have someone else take care of it? Or should you just forget about it altogether? With that, here's the episode. Again, you can find the original podcast broadcast of this by looking up the podcast New Architecture Books with Brian Topher. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Topher, Principal Architect of Topher Architecture, and you are listening to New Books Architecture, a podcast channel on the New Books Network dedicated to architecture and its publications. If you have any suggestions on authors who you would love to hear me speak with next, feel free to send me an email at btopher at topherarchitecture.com. Today's guest is Enoch Sears to talk about his book, Social Media for Architects. Enoch is the founder of Business of Architecture, Business of Architecture is a leading consultancy that helps architecture firms grow profitably and sustainably. So thank you very much for being here with me today and talking and being on the show. Brian, it's my pleasure to be here. So before we begin, can you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself past my little snippet? Absolutely. Well, there's obviously a lot of places I could go with that. But what I'd focus on right now is that over the past 10 years or so, I've built up this consultancy, Business of Architecture, where we help architects learn and master everything that they didn't learn in architecture school, which is basically how to run and manage a successful and profitable architecture firm. So we we don't help architects learn architecture. They're already, prof- they're already pros at that, everyone in their own right. What we help them do is learn the things that might have been left out of their education, everything else that you need to know and do if you're going to run and manage uh, an architecture firm. Great. And uh, yeah, I won't uh, spoil it, but there's quite a bit we don't learn out of school and how to run a business. So so jumping right into it, so I can't speak for everyone, but I know I personally, when I picked up the book, my first thought was, you know, I'm an architect and I have social media. So, you know, what can I learn here? And I'd love to hear you elaborate on more, but the reality is there's a difference between having social media and using it properly, particularly for a business. Abs- absolutely. And it's that's a great question. Brian, when I wrote the book originally, I believe it was back in 2012. Now, at the time when I wrote the book, Instagram wasn't even a thing. I mean, it was around, but it wasn't that popular. You know, so there's an, this book is, it is outdated from the social media side, right? So the social, for Instagram is not even in there. I, I've been meaning for years to write an update, but it's just not high on the priority list, right? So that's almost like a mortal sin that it doesn't talk about Instagram because right now Instagram is the number one platform. I would say what probably the, the number one or number, I would say probably the number one platform for architects right now is that, that right? architects love uh, basically because it's such a visual platform. You can share your images. I get carried away. I love looking on it. I mean, just architectural images look beautiful on Instagram and it's so fun to post. And also it's a very real time interactive thing. So going back to your question, when I originally wrote the book, architect, uh, you know, social media for architects, it actually was rather uh, unconventional for architects to know or do anything about architects, uh, about, sorry, about social media. And, um, and that's very, very different now. Cause I mean, look, we're right now it's 2021. It's, it's been nine, it's been almost 10 years since I wrote that book. However, when I wrote it, what I tried to focus on because I knew it would be outdated if I focused on just the technical how-to of how the social media 
networks work. Right. So I really tried to focus on a philosophy that would be timeless. So a philosophy about how to use the digital online tools that we have access to now with communication uh, in a way that it would be relevant 10 years ago and 10 years from now. So that's really what I try to do in the book. So if you read it, that's what you'll find. You'll find timeless principles that are applied to some of the major social media networks at the time, which were things like, you know, Twitter, blogging, Facebook, and others. Right. So that's that's what I'd say. I mean, you're you're 100% correct is that we have social media. Nowadays, a lot of people are very proficient with it, know how to use it. Perhaps the one thing that I even see nowadays that people aren't good at that good at is actually using it in a business context. And so this is where it ties this question ties directly into the work that we do at Business of Architecture because social media would fit into the kind of the marketing side of the business. If you're thinking about all the systems and frameworks you need to run a successful business, marketing is an important part of that. And social media is under that umbrella. So it's one small piece. Now, do architects need to use social media? Not at all. You can be a successful, you can be a successful firm owner today and not touch social media for anything. Uh, that's because it's just a communication channel like every other channel. So ultimately, if you're not using social media, you still have telephone, you still have email, you still have face-to-face, and that's the way business is always done. So for people who are wanting to learn how to use social media in their business, uh, it, it can be a very powerful tool. And that's some of the information that you'll find in that particular book is how to use it in a business context. Absolutely. And so we'll go through a little more of the specifics. You already touched on this, the fact, you know, you actually say, and I'll quote you, that it's it, it almost augments offline networking. It can't replace it, though. So you had just mentioned, you know, you can be successful without it. You know, but I guess we'll kind of focus on the fact that I think most of us are using it. You had mentioned that most people aren't using it correctly. And so I won't name any firms or to make any enemies. But I know when you had mentioned Instagram, the first thing that comes to mind is a lot of firms are posting a lot of their projects and firm news. And you have kind of you kind of mentioned in every chapter that that's kind of the incorrect way to use social media, even though a large percentage that's how they're using it. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So what I meant by that was not necessarily that that's a wrong way to do it, right. but that you need to supplement that with with a with something else, right? Because that that's what we call broadcasting. So that's when you're out right. there telling people about how great you are, what you do, and it, it in a social media context, especially depending on the platform, it can come across as very it's just kind of broadcasting and spammy and promotional <laughs> and it's just all about us. And so the point that I made in the book is that in addition to, now that's important because you want people to know about your work, Mm -hmm. you want people to know about your firm, and that's great to get that information out there. However, social media, it's called social for a reason. It's because social involves a two-way dialogue, right? So that means it's a place to engage with people. It's a place to comment, chat on what other people are posting. It's, you know, give them a thumbs up, give them a like. It's really a way to accelerate and create relationships. And so, you know, obviously if, if I was to go to a party or a networking mixer or any sort of in-person event. And I was that guy who talked about himself all the time and never tried to find out about anyone else. Well, no one, no one likes that. That's, <laughs> you're not going to make a whole lot of friends that way. Okay. And yet a lot of times we don't, we're not putting that on in the social media efforts that we do. Now, like I said, that's not necessary. For instance, right now, I personally don't even spend a whole lot of time on social media. I'm not always out there networking and, right? and things like that on social media. Because I haven't placed a priority on that in my business at this moment, right? So that's also part of the context. I would never want to suggest that a business is going to fail with if they don't do that or that they need to do it. Everything needs to go back to your strategic plan and it needs to be a reason, a strategic reason for why you would want to do that. So if social media marketing is an important part of your marketing strategy, which I believe it should be, then it's also important to have a two-way dialogue there and find out about people, post educational content right. that might be interesting to people instead of just all about us, right? So there's 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 a lot of, there's an acronym, E-I-E-I-O. I think <laughs> I talk about it in the book. You do. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. You want to mention that, Brian? Absolutely. You had mentioned educational content. And so I know things have been changing, but you still meet those who feel like if you put too much free stuff out there, you're losing business. 
Whereas you make the argument that the more educational advice you can give, it's actually better for your business. And you had, you know, you, 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 you just hinted at the acronym EIEIO, you know, how do you choose what to post? I think we'd all love to hear more about that. Yeah, go ahead. Tell, tell us what that acronym stands for. <laughs> Absolutely. You probably have it written down there, right? Entertain, inspire, educate, inform, and outrage. And like I said, when you talk to some people, the idea of giving away free advice, it's, it's changing, but some people still feel that as you're almost devaluing your service. And again, I think you make a great argument that the more you give, the more you get. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so what we're seeing. So let, let's address that. If I'm sharing my expertise or if I'm getting giving away my trade secrets, is that devaluing my advice? Well, right. there's a lot, there's a lot of different schools of thought on this. For instance, I, I've worked for firms in the past where they would never share the original CAD documents, uh, CAD files right? of particular buildings because they were afraid that a competitor would get a hold of them and, and right. get the upper edge on them. It's very similar in terms of sharing information or knowledge or expertise. Because if we look at the way that we live in the information age, if we look at the way that things are headed, knowledge and information is free. It's readily available. It's available everywhere for free. So what people are willing to pay for, people are willing to pay for someone that can catalog and condense that information. That's why we buy books, right? Because (laughs) if you have like a nice business book that comes out, I mean, you're not going to say, why would I buy that book? I can look up that information on the internet, right? Right. Well, the value Absolutely. in a book is the the narrative the author has gone through to actually pull all that information into one place. It'd probably take me a year to pull together the same information. That's a good point. Right. So it's there, there's value to that. Now, in terms of perhaps an architect or a service provider, someone who's an expert, ultimately where their value resides is not in information, but it's in the applied information. It's it's the experience right. that people have when they work with them. It's the added value that they bring to a project. And so that that's going to be something that can never be duplicated. Right. Brian. So, you know, when we look at some of the other industries that have been hit really hard by outsourcing, by, you know, the globalization mm-hmm. of services, one example would be 99designs.com. So this is for our friends who are graphic designers. Like back in the 80s, the 90s, being a graphic designer was fantastic. <laughs> it was like being an art, being like, you know, it was like, it was great. Um, that changed over time when companies came in and they, they started offering these very inexpensive options, right? graphic design solutions for businesses. So I think 99designs, the way they started was you could pay $99 and you could get all these designers from around the world to compete and right. do these free logos. And then you would pick one of them and then there's your logo, right? Well, graphic designers hated this, as you can imagine, because now, you know, they're like, wow, people don't respect our work. We have to go and we have to all compete and we have to do free work and they're only going to pay us $99 for it. And so that's the reason why I bring that up is because that's just one example of how industries are changing over time through this idea of crowdsourcing, through outsourcing, et cetera. But one thing that 99designs will never be able to compete with is your individual talent as a designer, right? So that's sort of the X factor. That's that's the one key thing that a robot's never going to be able to do that. Uh, that's, that's, your, that's your secret sauce. So the same thing Absolutely. goes to architects, any other professional right? Is that ultimately they might outsource drafting. You might not be able to compete with drafts people who are in a different country, but ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to see that the high value tasks are going to be the tasks that, that are going to make the most money and provide the most value. I think that's a great explanation. You've seen the same thing, Brian. What are your thoughts on that? I, so, yeah, so, you know, I, I try to keep my own personal bias out, but as a small scale residential architect, I often am competing with moonlighters, people who know how to use drafting software, which is different than being an architect, but I'll save that for another day. And so, however, and so this is anecdotal, there's no numbers, but I do remember sharing, someone had hired a moonlighting drafter and the, the work was okay. And I went to a lot of length and I explained the building code implications of their project to a great amount of detail. And I remember thinking I lost that job and I just gave that draft rules free work. But by the more, because I explained so much, that person who thought the building code was this little checklist they looked at 
realized that it literally is something for professional architects to deal with. And so I can actually say I won that job. And so maybe that's a, a dramatic example, but by sharing all of that knowledge, it kind of proves that, you know, architects don't draw floor plans. We, we do a million other things. So I would agree with you. Yeah, I, that's I, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, one, one important <laughs> distinction that we make, and we teach this to all the firms who we work with to help them, the firms that come to us improve their profitability, mm -hmm. want to grow, want to create a more sustainable and consistent business is that you need to be very careful about not giving away free work, right? Absolutely. So what should be free, what should be free are leveraged assets, like a report you wrote, you know, something that doesn't take any more of your work to actually deliver. So in okay. your example, Brian, you know, what you could do is put all those suggestions into a, a handy ebook right. or white paper and then just mm -hmm. hand it to them and save yourself an hour. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, yeah, so we kind of, we got to make sure that we draw the line with the free expertise is that Absolutely. if you're talking to me and I'm delivering expertise directly to you, you're going to pay good money for that. But right. I also have these other assets because I've created videos or I've created eBooks or papers or reports. Those are free or we may even sell those. But so that's kind of one key distinction that architects, when they work with us, they kind of, a little light bulb goes off and they think, oh yeah, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should charge for my time. Yeah, Absolutely. And that's, kind of, where's, and that's, the, where's the free line? And that's a perfect segue, you know, into one of your chapters, the idea of blogging. You know, I know it seems like a huge time commitment to a lot of people. I know I personally can't keep it consistent to save my life, but you just made the case that by doing the work, you now have an asset you can leverage. So yeah, it is a time commitment, but you can then just like writing a book and selling it for the rest of your life, that piece of content can now be handed to everyone you meet. Yeah, that's that that's a great that's why I love blog why blogging can be such a great tool because you are creating an asset, like you said, mm -hmm. Brian. And so it's sort of the thing where you know, we always talk about working on the business, not in the business. So creating assets for the business, things that can be reused again and again and again would be things like an article that goes over a specific topic that right. you can use as part of your marketing when you engage with clients. Absolutely. And so you had mentioned that obviously things have changed in 10 years, you know, Instagram being the number one, but the one I, I personally have the least amount of knowledge with is Twitter. In fact, you even call, you, you state that it's the most misunderstood and most underutilized. I, do you believe that's still the case? That's a good question. You know what? I've gone. I went on a Twitter diet. I don't. I'm not even on Twitter anymore. <laughs> I used to use it pretty heavily. Uh, I, you know, uh, I I like Twitter. I think it's a great platform. So when I wrote the book, Twitter was still where it was limited to. I think 140 characters, right, 160 for, characters, for something message. like that. Right. That was the old school Twitter. Yep. Yeah, where it was just like short and snippy and boom and it was it had this great feel to it because it was very right. interactive it was very personal mm -hmm. then twitter started competing with other people and they 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 increased the number of characters right um they added the opportunity to video uh That's right. all sorts of stuff like that i think they purchased periscope or something and right so and and ultimately what ended up happening with that is it just became a very spammy network which unfortunately is the way that a lot of things happen to go. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I did like about Twitter is that you could always create lists. And so I would put on a list, I would put the people who actually wanted to follow who were more conversational. Mm -hmm. And then that worked for me. Um, but yeah, Twitter is one of those networks. I haven't been on it in ages, but what I can say is that uh, it is still a great network and it is a great conversational network. I found that in the book, what I wrote is that Twitter was one of the best networks to connect with people like journalists because they yes. seem to really enjoy Twitter. Journalists, publishers, it was sort of, it, was, it had a much more personal feel than all the other networks, which is really nice. Well, and so you, to elaborate on that, you actually mentioned that Twitter's biggest strength is one of the biggest advantages of using any of these social medias is the more authentic you are, the more people pick up on that and it helps you. And you said Twitter is kind of the best for that. And so things may have changed, but so you had mentioned they're trying to mimic video. And so we'll address the one that at the time you didn't write about, you know, YouTube. So, I, you know, I think when you mentioned being authentic, how do you see, what, what is the advantage to that? How do you see it helping, I guess, getting clients for a business? Well, YouTube's a great, a great channel and authenticity is always important. Right. Uh, one of my mentors once told me, I mean, auth authenticity, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast interview. <laughs> but um, 
you know, one of the mentors who's taught me says that uh, authenticity, you're authentic when you're authentic about being inauthentic. <laughs> So That's the idea one. is that human beings, we're, we're not authentic and we have to be authentic about not being authentic. All right. That's only when you can have true authenticity is when you're authentic, that you're not authentic. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. But what I, yeah. Right. Brian, uh, what I do like about YouTube is it, you can have everything from a cell phone camera, kind of very rough uh, video on YouTube that can go viral and get tons of exposure and be a great medium for connecting with people. Or you can have like a highly polished cinematic right. experience. And so there's so much you can do with video. YouTube is amazing. I love YouTube. I think it's unfortunate that right now they're trying to push their paid, their paid service on YouTube because it's kind of messed up the network a little bit. Um, because for me, I actually enjoy, I don't know if you find this brand, but I enjoy getting the ads on YouTube. Uh, I guess when it, when the algorithm is working and it's so targeted that it's actually showing me things I didn't know I wanted to look at, I agree. Yeah, and so I guess the longer, right. you, I guess that's the value of using it long enough where that becomes smarter. I'll say a few yeah. years ago, if you would have asked me that, I would have said absolutely not. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And when I say I like the ads, I would say for that reason, right? When I get totally untargeted ads where I'm like, why am I being shown this <laughs> right. ad? You know, like absolutely. get your, get your associate's degree at University of Phoenix. I'm like, uh, absolutely. I'm way past that, you know? That, that yes. doesn't make sense. But within all those ads that are more noise, there are ads where I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I saw this ad because I'm looking for something exactly like this. Mm -hmm. And that that's a useful experience right. for me. And so I wouldn't want to get the paid version of YouTube because I actually enjoy seeing what companies are doing out there in the advertising space. But YouTube's a fun, it, it's a fun medium. It's going to continue to grow. Uh, it is the second largest, last time Absolutely. I checked, the second largest search engine right, right after Google meaning that yes. people are searching that there. statistic is still valid. Yeah. Yep. yeah. You had mentioned, you know, sadly we live in the membership economy. You have to subscribe to your grocery store and your, your streaming service. And it looks like even the internet's going to be jumping on board with that, but it, it is kind of a contrast to an important point. I think you made with the book that many years ago and still the idea of kind of low barrier to entry democratization of knowledge, as you said, you know, I've made YouTube videos with my cell phone and this is a $50 pair of headphones that I can podcast with. Even 10 years ago, that was not the case. So not to say it's an inclusive group, but it has changed to you can do it if you want to, if you want to be out there. You know, I won't put you on the spot, but I happen to know you, you have shared that you started your business because you interviewed architects because it's something you wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's. I'm glad you brought that up. That's my history. That's that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now because I was an architecture firm owner and I was clueless about the business side of things, and I didn't have a network and I didn't know how to grow and get the kind of clients I wanted. Right. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna, I'm not the kind of guy that gives up easily. So I'm gonna crack this nut. I'm gonna become the best read, uh, the best studied person on the business side of architecture. And along the path, along that journey. Well, I started to love it. I loved it more than the architecture, the actual business side. <laughs> and like you said, I started the podcast and and I just decided to share my experiences and the things that I was learning and the guests I was interviewing uh, out there in the world. And because of that, I mean, now it's it's become a business, a very uh, a great business for me, provides for my family. We have team members. Uh, we have clients all around the world. And all that started because of the free sharing of content, Brian, that you mentioned earlier. That's great. That's great to hear. And so, you know, again, we'll, we'll move away from sadly, you know, what YouTube's doing to change. But, you know, so of course, we're talking social media and we've kind of not purposely, we've ignored kind of the two big elephants in the room, and that is Facebook versus LinkedIn. And I know things have changed in the last 10 years, but I think everything you said then is just as relevant. I guess the first question I know, particularly for students who are in school, I, I actually do get this question, you know. What is the difference between Facebook and LinkedIn? I know it sounds like a simple answer, but I think I'd like to hear your perspective on that for architects. Sure. So Facebook traditionally has been a much more personal platform. It's built around people, personal lives. So you'll see lots of personal things on there, parties, the kids being born, a lot of political opinions. Yeah. I mean, that's what Facebook is famous for is people mm -hmm. spouting off all their their ideologies as if they're the, the gospel, mm -hmm. you know? Um and uh, 
So it's a very personal, it's, it's a very, a very open forum, shall we say it's right. like Facebook, uh, you know, and, um, I can't remember the example I give in, in the book, but you know, it's like, it's like going to the playground, basically. That's how I describe it now. I don't know what I wrote in the book, but it's it's kind of like going to the, going to the park, a family picnic, mm-hmm. where you know you're just hanging out. You know, Joe and Bob are over there having a beer. You know, over there the kids are running around playing in the sandbox, and you know, Johnny right. and he's he's throwing little Charlie up in the air. You know, it's kind of that kind of experience, right? Right. LinkedIn, on the other hand is is very buttoned down so that's like the the business networking event where you go there's a little cocktail right. party there's nice music in the background it's all business talk mostly you know your <laughs> people are talking about their businesses what they're doing it's like a networking mm-hmm. event you know um, right so I, I find that linkedin is linkedin is much more formal uh it's 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 a little bit f- less fun to look at in my opinion <laughs> because it can be a little dry whereas facebook is always kind of be exciting and kind of interesting. So that's Mm. sort of the theme of the two networks, the way I would describe it to people who aren't familiar with those two networks. No, that's great. And from a more practical standpoint, they, they both technically, they both work very similar, meaning that you have a newsfeed, you post posts, you can post pictures and videos. And yeah. And so I, like I said, I I hinted that that seems like a simple question. What I'm leading to is what you said, you said this 10 years ago, and I think it's still true now for whatever reasons, face architects seem to just be adverse and unwilling to adopt Facebook, even though, as you said, there really isn't much difference except for a perceived formality in LinkedIn. And so I don't think that's changed. I think Facebook is still ignored by architects. I think most don't even want to deal with it, you know, but it sounds, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like you see that as an opportunity for architects and business. Yeah. Brian, you're pretty, I mean, you're pretty insightful. You really nailed it. Uh, that That is the way I feel. And, you know, even at the time I wrote the book, because there was always that confusion when, when Facebook first came out, I remember there was, you was always, you were always hearing stories about how someone got fired because one of their yes. drunk pictures from college turned up on their feed and their boss saw it or something like that. Right. right so yep. that's the fear that a lot of architects and professionals have about Facebook is it's such a personal network. They don't want to show their own personal lives and information on there because they're, they don't want to mix business right. and pleasure. And I get that. What they don't realize and kind of what I talked about in the book is that you can get around that just by managing because Facebook will let you make basically make Correct. groups of friends. So you can have a mm-hmm. professional side of your list and you can have a personal side and then just make sure you don't post any personal stuff to for your for your other network. You know, so it is manageable. And I I agree that nowadays people are craving, like you said earlier, they're craving authenticity. We're craving a human experience, especially right now with COVID right. happening. Like we want, we want the human element. Absolutely. And so I think that you're right. Facebook is it overlooked and there's still opportunity there for sure. And, it, and you know, again, it's everything I have is anecdotal. I don't have proof. You know, I, I personally, when I release news of these podcasts, I do it on LinkedIn and I do it on Facebook. There is a dramatic change in how many people engage it on Facebook versus LinkedIn. When in reality, it seems like this is perfect for LinkedIn. I get very small engagement, whereas Facebook, it's actually much larger. And you, I think you already hinted at it. It's the idea that it's a little more personal. It's more human. It's it's conversations versus monologues. And that's a direct quote from you. I, I didn't say that, but and yeah, so thank you, thank you. So I, I I think that's great. And so you know, I, I think you answered the question. And so I I, I don't you know I don't want to make you kind of re- repeat it, but you had mentioned you had some very good case studies in the book. And so I think this is a bit of a vague question. I guess the question is over the years, you know, some time has passed now, so. Have you seen improvement in the areas? Is it maintained? I, I kind of hinted, I think Facebook stayed the same. Have you seen improvement? Do you think everyone is just as using it the way they did 10 years ago for any of the channels, Twitter, that's blogging? A, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I would say I would say there hasn't been as much improvement as I would have thought over okay. 10 years <laughs> of people using it really effectively. You know, there are there are a number of firms uh, especially the younger firm owners who are out there doing stuff on social media and they're, yep. they're crushing it. They're doing an absolutely great job. Uh, any, everyone should go follow Ryan Willard. He's our director of consulting right, yep. and educational services. He's, he has a very big following on social media. He does a great job of it. Um, but I'd say it hasn't been as dramatic as I would have thought. And if anyone wants 
if you want to go see some of the case studies, there are some great case studies in the book. You can just Absolutely. do a search on Google for, yeah, social media for architects. Yeah, and I didn't mean to dismiss them. You, know, you It's a Spacio Design Studio and Mark English. I thought those were great. I'm actually going to try some things that I don't do. So, You had mentioned that you see that a lot of smaller firms seem to be more successful than larger firms. And I know I'm going to oversimplify this, but it does seem to come down to the fact that consistency is really key. And it does seem like the smaller firms can stay a little more consistent than larger firms. Would you agree that that seems to be what's causing this divide versus big firms and smaller firm success? On social media? That, that's a good question, Brian. And I, I don't know that I would say right now that smaller firms are more successful. I would say on social okay. media, maybe better at doing it. In the past, they were. That's a good Nowadays, yes. the, the larger firms that have more resources, they produce a lot of great content on social media. Some of them are doing absolutely wonderful things. HOK, Gensler come to mind. Yes. Firms yep. that have very robust social media profiles that, that are really fantastic and they're they're led by a person, so you get responses when you when you respond back and everything like that. Uh, I would say that, um, yeah, I guess that that has changed a bit. You know, that that definitely has changed a bit. I'd say the larger firms right now are actually have really taken a hold of those things. But mm-hmm. where the small firms uh, kind of have an advantage, if you look at it from a marketing standpoint, is that a lot of times on social media, people want to talk with the head of the business. Absolutely right. So. When you have a direct connection to the business owner, there's a more personal connection there, right? I would agree. And so like, yeah. So if 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 Gensler's social media channel was run by someone, one of the co-CEOs of Gensler, and you got responses when you when you tweeted at that person or, or mentioned that person, that would be pretty cool. But of course, they're very busy. They have other <laughs> things to do than hang out on social media. So that is the that's the difficulty. Absolutely. And I think, again, maybe I'm overthinking it. I think that could kind of explain not just COVID. I mean, clearly podcasting has been on the rise. Videos are on the rise. And I, I think if you maybe not everyone can can pinpoint it, but I think there is a reality that looking at someone's face while they're talking, especially as you said, if it's the firm owner, there does seem to be kind of a link between that connection, I will say, connection between seeing and hearing. And, you know, I know. You, yeah. And that's. Oh, you kind of you kind of brought something something to mind. You know, if you look at what's interesting, if you look at real estate agents, like if you look at a real estate agent's business card, what do they always have on the business card? A picture of them smiling. There you go, Brian. You got a picture of them smiling. And of course, we look at that and we think that's so cheesy. That just looks really hokey, you know. And on the billboards, they always have the picture of them right. smiling and stuff. And I get that. But if you look at architects' websites and what we put out as architects, it's the opposite. I agree. Right. So a lot of times when I get emails from architects or they communicate with me, I always go to their website to kind of check them out and see, but I can never find pictures of them. I can never find them anywhere on the website. I find their work. I find kind of this formal about us kind of, you know, kind of description. But I'm like, where's the person here? I don't, I I can't even get to know the person. All I'm seeing, you know, so that's an interesting cultural, cultural divide there. And I think there's a happy medium there. I think you don't need to be the the flashy person with the big smile and the cheesy grin on the business card. But there should be on your website, um, people want to connect with people, you know? Absolutely. And make the story interesting. You know, I, I, don't, I personally did not have a picture of me when I started. My wife convinced me to have it. Uh, again, it's an anecdote. When I wrote my first book, my wife may, had forced me to take a picture of me smiling. I think she like tickled me. Good for me your or, wife. Good for her. Yeah. Brian. And, uh, you know, and I'll be honest, and again, not to sound arrogant, when she said that and wanted to do that, I, I completely rejected it. I was like, there's no need. And that's cheesy. And I don't have numbers. I have people who talk to me who have proven me wrong and have given my wife ammunition to say she was right. But so I think that's a great point you bring up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm glad you're able to. I was the same way. I mean, when I was in, fully in architecture and practicing, I mean, I didn't want to be on my website. That was like... <laughs> I was like, scary, you know, people might see me. What would they think about me? And there's all sorts of reasons why I wouldn't want to do that. You know, people come here for the work. I want to make it nice and clean. And it's about the, you know, it's the same thing with architectural photography. How many times you see a person in the photo? I mean, Uh, they put them in there more nowadays, but usually it's like if you put a person in and you spoil the picture. (laughs) Yeah, nope, I agree. And, uh, you know, I know when you're in architecture school, you have to force the students to put scale figures in because most people don't want to draw that. I know I didn't. And so it's also, you know, as I've been doing these podcasts, I know 
whenever I ask most guests about video versus audio, most don't want to do video. I know you happen to do a lot of these, so maybe you have a comfort level, but I do think for a lot of people, and I'll include myself, there is something different about just being on camera. You, I, I haven't done anything different than my audio only interviews, but there is something a little different. And again, I know you're a professional and you've done this for so long, but maybe you could speak to that a little bit. I mean, when you started, did you feel the same way? That's That's a great point. Um, there's two parts to that. So number one is how I feel about it. I've always been okay with video. I've always liked okay. it. It's it's never felt completely comfortable, but I've gotten more and more comfortable as time goes on. It's yeah. it's hard for me to speak and monologue into a camera. That's really difficult. It just feels <laughs> awkward. So that that's hard for me too, you know. Mm. Um, but the the other half of that would be, well, so first part is yes, it's hard to speak into a camera. Um, the second part is that, you know, it's. Well, it is it is super powerful because you get to see someone's inflection. You get to see that the Absolutely. way that they're they're responding. You get to see the body language, uh, and there's there's something to say for that side of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, of course, I I I could pick your brain on every aspect of the internet that's changed in the last ten years, but I don't want to hold you up for that. But so you've you've mentioned that a lot of time has passed. You know, so what 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 has what projects have you been working on? What has kept you busy? since the book came out. Yeah, thank you. So what we've been busy doing, so since the book came out and I launched the podcast and 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 started to get information out mm -hmm. that architects need to hear about how they can run more successful practices, I've focused, ex like for the past year, we've basically rebuilt our, our consulting framework and our consulting agency to right? be able to help architects in a very, very powerful way. So that's what we've been focused on lately. And we just relaunched our executive leadership training program. It's called Smart Practice. It's for small firm owners who didn't go to business school. They don't have time for business school, but they want to grow their, their impact in their firms. They want to perhaps land better projects. They want to earn higher income and more profit. Mm -hmm. They really want to excel and they want to they turn their business into something that is actually an asset not just a job, but it's actually a business asset, meaning it's, they use it to build wealth. So that's right. that's the latest program that we've launched and we're working with firm owners in that program every single day. That's what I do when I'm not, you know, the podcast is just an opportunity for us to share with other Absolutely. people outside of our network. But that's what I've been focused on, Brian, is building up that program for our architects to help them create just incredible practices and have amazing impact in the world so that so that the business, which can oftentimes be complex and confusing and frustrating, doesn't hold them yeah. back from what they can truly do in an architectural sense. Great. I, I'll urge all my listeners to go check it out. I know there's quite a, to say there's a lot of content would be an understatement, I think. It's quite a bit to look at, read, and watch. And so the book is Social Media for Architects. Perhaps in the future, we can talk again about any future additions you can squeeze in. And I want to thank you very much for talking with me and being on the show today. Thanks, Brian, for reaching out and congratulations on doing this great thing going on. Oh, thank you. You too. Good luck. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.